I think that's the best analogy. Uh, there's also another analogy that's wonderful. And medical school is sometimes like eating a sack of pancakes. Eating pancakes is awesome, but when you have to do it each and every day, you know, it can get exhausting. And, um, you know, medical school has a lot of very interesting information, but again, it's just a lot of volume and having to come back for that sack of pancakes each day is tricky. And so there are a lot of misconceptions about what a radiologist does. And some people think we just dictate into a microphone and that is partially true. Um, some people really have no idea what we do. Um, kids think maybe that we play video games and yeah, we'll, we'll maybe demystify some of this, some of these misconceptions. So this is a picture of actually the very first radiograph of the very first x-ray that was ever taken. And this is a picture of this man's wife with her uh, hand and her wedding ring. So I just thought this was the kind of cool historical thing to include. So what is radiology? So radiology is kind of the imaging of medicine. It's the eye of medicine. So if someone has, let's say, abdominal pain or a certain complaint, they we don't always know exactly what's going on. Uh, and sometimes that requires we get imaging. And the workstation kind of looks like this for the radiologist. So it's kind of a behind the scenes specialty. We have these cool 4K or 8K, 6K monitors that cost as, as much as a, as a small car. And on these screens, we can pull up x-rays, we can pull up CT scans, we can pull up ultrasounds or sonograms, as well as MRI scans and all sorts of nuclear studies. Um, so I think it's important to know that maybe uh, ultrasound and MRI do not have ionizing radiation. This is in comparison to x-rays and CT scans. So Radiologists essentially focus on making diagnoses, but they also focus on treating diseases. And we also help the clinicians and the surgeons, like the primary doctors basically, um, manage uh, patient care and help them make decisions. Uh, this is kind of a funny meme where, you know, the doctor is saying, don't worry, the x-ray is completely harm harmless. And then when, when you're actually getting the x-ray, it's like everyone hides, right? Um, and the reason for that, again, is for uh, ionizing radiation, you know, we, we learn about so many different procedures in radiology. Um, we do see patients, contrary to some misconceptions. Um, we do what's called protocoling, where we figure out what type of study is the best type of study to order for a certain indication or a certain concern that a primary doctor has. Um, we also worry about contrast reactions. Oftentimes patients are allergic to the contrast that we have to administer to improve the quality of our imaging. Um, we also interact with radio radiology technicians and technologists. Um, and again, we, we learn about radiation and safety. And I think an X-ray has as much radiation as flying from New York City to San Francisco, I think three times. And a CT scan may have 10 or 100 times uh, that amount of radiation. And we, we do learn about physics. This is more medical physics. It's not kind of the college or high school physics. Um, and when we are um, uh, potentially exposed to radiology or to radiation, we oftentimes wear uh, the appropriate protective equipment, such as a lead suit uh, that might cover, let's say, our thyroid and our uh, reproductive organs, as well as our chest and abdomen. So this is kind of a funny cartoon because um, this is the little blurb here saying, you'll never amount to anything staring at that screen all day. And this is kind of what a radiologists or di diagnostic radiologists does for a good amount of their workflow is that they look at a screen and pull up the images and dictate a report into a microphone or a dictaphone and send that report off into the ether for the clinicians to um, to use to make decisions about patient care. And then 30 years later, you know, it's just funny, you know, son, I'm so happy that you made something of yourself and stop sitting around staring at that screen all day. Um, some non-medical aspects about radiology, I think it's important to know how many scans per shift you might be responsible for uh, reading. That could range anywhere from, you know, 50 to 100 or up to 200 studies that come in. This is usually a mix of CT scans, MRIs, X-ray, and ultrasounds, for example. And in there, it will be, you know, sprinkled in some patient care and some seniors and stuff like that. Typical hours are basically shift work. So you show up and get the work done for the day, and then you go home. So some specialties in radiology, however, um, have to take call because there are sometimes emergencies that have to be taken care of. 
And so the typical hours are, you know, 40 to 50 hours a week as an attending, which I think is, is fairly reasonable. Um, vacation and salary, thankfully, are on the upper end of physician uh, vacation and salaries, which I think is a net positive. Um, there are some differences between private practice and academics, as well as urban versus rural practices of radiology. For example, in academics, you might be only reading the studies that you are fellowship trained in. Let's say you're fellowship trained in musculoskeletal radiology. You'll primarily be reading that. Well, your practice will be more of a community setting and it might be uh, more of a variety and kind of the same holds between the differences. Uh, rural, you might be more of a kind of jack of all trades, if that makes sense. Um, regarding malpractice, I'll say that radiology is one of the, um, it's not the most litigated specialty, but I'd say it's on the moderate side of uh, litigation. Um, this is a funny cartoon, you know, only the radiologists will, you know, bang their mouse on the table when it stops working because we do use our mouse to scroll a lot. And then other people at the pet store might be looking. So I hope you guys enjoy these kind of funny memes that I've sprinkled in throughout. Um, this guy is saying, man, I hope the imaging volume isn't too high today. And there are some stressful aspects about radiology. And one of those might be um, imaging volume because um, we have to clear the list, basically. The list gets sprinkled in with studies that trickle in, and then we have to uh, get through the work. So if you're wondering how many weeks of vacation a radiologist might take, um, here's a nice uh, graphical rep representation on that. Um, it's, it wouldn't be uncommon to have more than six weeks of vacation, which I think is pretty cool. If you're wondering, do radiologists feel fairly compensated? You know, this isn't a, a raw number of how much money they're making, but you know, they feel fairly uh, compensated, which is which is really nice, I think. And I don't think it should be taboo to talk about uh, talk about money because you know, student loans are a really big deal, as you guys all know, and it takes a long time to be a physician. Um, so kind of move, moving along, what is a radiologist day? What does it kind of look like? Well, it kind of looks like this. If you're a diagnostic radiologist, you're spending a lot of time at the computer. So it's as close as you can get to a desk job or computer job. Um, you have to be good at communicating, of course, because you're interacting with different clinicians and different surgeons who are calling you um, or interacting with you via pages or uh, text messaging, or if they might be coming into your reading room. Uh, to discuss patient care. So throughout the day, you'll probably be doing a mix of procedures, um, consenting, talking to patients, protocoling, like I talked about earlier, as well as teaching. So teaching and studying is a big aspect about the specialty. So if you have a resident, you'll be taking time out of the day to teach them as well as potentially giving a lecture at a conference uh, during noontime, for example. So you'll be on the phone, you might be doing research and you, might have to go to clinic if you are a breast imager or an interventional radiologist. So I hope that kind of paints a colorful picture about what a radiologist day looks, looks like. Um, some radiologists basically spend all their time in the reading room. And if that's what you are looking for, then we have that as well. So I think a really cool thing is that you have a lot of flexibility to kind of craft your practice of medicine into the way you want. Um, and this is a funny graphic because this is kind of the daily activities of a kind of generic or general uh, medical doctor. So a lot of time it feels like we're entering irrelevant things um, in order to satisfy, you know, um, insurance companies and billing, et cetera, and so on. Sometimes we're waiting for labs and scans and, um, you know, a small amount of the time we're doing patient care. So I think one aspect about radiology, which is cool, is that we focus primarily on looking for disease or looking for pathology and imaging. So we're not spent, we're not spending a lot of time doing all of this other stuff, so to speak. Um, so this is again, driving home that same point. How many weeks, how many hours per week does a radiologist spend doing paperwork and administration? So as you can see here, we're down here with anesthesia and ophthalmology where it's, it's fairly on the low end. You can see kind of the specialties that are on the upper end. And I think this is also a uh, net positive aspect about the specialty. Um, what is the most rewarding part of the job? Um, a lot of people say being very good at finding diagnoses and answers and kind of putting the pieces of the puzzle together and helping others and knowing that you're making a difference. So imaging is a really important part of patient care. It can really make a, uh, make a difference in someone's life.
So I've talked about some of the reasons why I chose the specialty. I'll uh, kind of touch on them again and kind of summarize uh, here as well. So we have direct impacts on patient outcomes. And if you think about it this way, you may be able to impact 50 or 100 or 200 people's uh, lives in a single day. Whereas someone might be able, let's say, you know, you're doing five or 10 surgeries in a day, or if you're in a clinic, you may be seeing 10 or 20 or 30 patients in a day. So I feel like the impact is, is really large. Um, it, like I said, it's really, uh, imaging is very crucial to making actual clinical decisions. Am I gonna take this patient to surgery or am I not? Am I gonna manage them medically or not, et cetera, and so on. Um, I kind of talked about this earlier. There's little paperwork and bureaucracy, and there's basically a focus on anatomy and pathology, which is really awesome. I really enjoyed kind of focusing on the science of medicine rather than the insurance companies, you know, making calls to the pharmacy, worrying about complex social discharge situations and patient disposition, et cetera, and so on. So another cool aspect is that we have a really broad breadth of diversity in the pathology that we see. And some of the rarest diagnoses, diagnoses in the sickest patients require imaging and they require often a lot of imaging. So that makes the specialty very interesting, I think. And we also interact with a wide variety of specialists. So you may be on the phone with, you know, a breast surgeon or an oncologist, but you also might be talking with an orthopedic surgeon or a sports medicine doctor. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, I think it's relatively innovative and cutting edge, uh, very high tech, if you will. Uh, we'll talk about artificial intelligence and what its implications might be in the specialty of the future. Um, and there's a big emphasis on teaching and research. Um, Garden setting, you know, sometimes there's a lot to know, and for good reason. Um, radiology residency is a total of six years, including fellowship, and there's a lot to know because we have to know. Let's say it's one diagnosis, one diagnosis. Um, we have to know the diagnosis in many different types of imaging modalities: X-ray, ultrasound, MRI, CT scan, etc., and so on. And so that kind of um, increases the amount of knowledge that we need to know. So something to keep in mind. Um, this is a funny cartoon. Like, all you have to do is find me, and this is pathology. And then this is anatomy. So anatomy kind of gets away of, you have to know, basically you have to know anatomy first before um, you can find the pathology. So um, anatomy is really big in radiology. This is the physician pain scale. So how would you rate your pain on a scale of orthopedics to nephrology? So ortho here, again, one of the, I guess, less painful specialties. Radiology is on the higher end up here with plastics, oncology, and derm. And then you can see the, the specialties that rate um, more than that. So, um, you know, you might say, uh, they're in the dream or it's good to be me, so. Um, again, 93% of the time they'll say yes. So, again, uh, thumbs up. So a few more reasons why I chose the specialty. So I noticed that people would switch into the specialty from other specialties. So I was like, okay, that's cool. But I noticed that people would not generally switch out of the specialty of radiology. So that was interesting. It piqued my interest as a medical student. Um, you also have to think like, am I more of a thinker or am I more of a thinker? You know, Radiology is, uh, diagnostics anyway, it has, it's a very cerebral workflow and it's a lot of thinking. So if you enjoy that, if you enjoy kind of problem solving, um, then I will enjoy radiology as well. Um, on the note, kind of the reading room, if you can imagine it's like a room, multiple workstations and multiple computers. Um, it's generally a lower stress, low noise, chill place. It's darker so that we can see the imaging better on others. Um, and it's just full of chill, humble, and laid back people is how I would describe the culture. And this cartoon is kind of drive home this point, which is 21st century. So getting a thorough history and physical exam from the patient is far and away one of the most important things any physician can do. But sometimes you can't get an accurate physical or history because the patient might be sedated, or too ill to cooperate. So sometimes you have to get a CT scan and kind of figure out what's going on. So I thought that was cool as well. 
Um, in med school, we learn a lot about the physical exam and in real practice, sometimes, you know, we'll see that it, uh, its importance isn't as, uh, as heavily weighted, so to speak. So there's a big emphasis on imaging in clinical practice. Um, if you're wondering why to pick radiology, you know, it's fascinating, like I kind of described earlier. If you don't want to see patients, we have that for you as well. You know, if you want to see patients, there are specialties like IR and breast imaging that offer much more patient care and much more procedural work. Um, why not? You know, uh, there's maybe some social isolation, but you don't, you know, I don't find the need to have to socialize at work, for example. So I get that kind of outside of work. So it's nice because you have that work-life balance. So um, if you're interested in interventional radiology, I mean, they do some super cool stuff. Um, I won't talk a lot about it here, um, but if you're into procedures and work, working with your hands, basically being like a minimally invasive surgeon using imaging to guide what you're doing, um, you know, this is the specialty for you. They do some super cool stuff, but if you, you know, uh, you might be, you might get tired of that. Um, being on your feet, wearing lead kind of takes a toll on you. So something to keep in mind. Um, and you also have to take call. So there's, there's a few more emergencies uh, that you have to worry about in interventional radiology. So uh, just depends on what you're looking for. I'm not saying one is better or one is worse. So uh, a few more reasons why. Um, this is kind of Jim from the office. As you can see, he is saying, uh, he's looking through uh, his colleagues and uh, he's about to go home for the day. So um, I think shift work is, is quite nice. And um, there are a lot of fellowship options. I talked about some of them earlier. You can do musculoskeletal imaging, which is more like sports medicine stuff. Um, you can focus on neuroradiology, which is brain and spinal cord, um, breast imaging, interventional. There's abdominal imaging, pediatric imaging, nuclear medicine. Um, so there's a lot of room for career flexibility. Some of those, I'd say kind of breast imaging has uh, the best probably work-life balance, you know, no call during the week, um, basically banker's hours and then no uh, weekend work and very few emergencies, if any. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of flexibility with as much patient care as you want or as little as you want. Um, so in general, kind of the radiologist is kind of the doctor's doctor. This isn't to put any other specialty down. It's just like we are a consultant for the imaging. So if someone has a question about it, um, then they consult us, which is cool. Um, it also lends itself really nicely to remote work. Uh, if you can imagine, you could be dictating your studies at home in your underwear, which is kind of a funny thing. Uh, but it, you know, the kind of the, the computer desk job aspect of it lends itself nicely to that. So I feel like that having the option to do that is cool if that's what you want to do. Um, and then again, work-life balance. Um, I think we have that here in our specialty. And you also want to think about career longevity. Like, do I want to do the specialty and how long can I do it for? Am I going to be burned out when I'm 45 or 50? Am I going to be able to do it if I need to work until I'm 70 or 75, for example? So I felt with diagnostic radiology, I could definitely do that. Um, I talked about shift work earlier. I think IR is the exception to this um, because they have to take call for emergencies. So sometimes there might be stroke call or it's some sort of GI bleed they have to worry about. Um, again, shift work, this is SpongeBob kind of hiding away from the ER doctor who is requesting a scan the minute before that he needs to leave. So um, of course, let's say an x-ray does come in the minute before. The cool thing is that you pull it up, it takes a few minutes to dictate it, and then you're out of there. It's not like you're stuck doing work for like an hour, right? Um, or, or two hours. Sometimes I've been on call, you know, technically until seven o'clock, and then I'm still at the hospital until 930, kind of wrapping things up. So um, if you're wondering what procedures we are doing, you can um, see some of those here. Funny cartoon here, again, patients like, you know, are you the see one, do one, or teach one here? Um, and in musculoskeletal radiology, we might do more joint injections, put some steroids in a certain joint. Um, we might do a lumbar puncture to take a sample of the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, let's say to look for meningitis in a patient if you are in neuroradiology. In pediatrics, we do, there's a certain intestinal um, emergency called an intussusception. So a peds radiologist, might go ahead and reduce that um, with what's called a pneumatic enema or an air or contrast enema. Um, if you're an abdominal imager, then you might be draining abscesses. If you're in breast imaging, you'll be doing a lot of biopsies and talking to patients and uh, talking to patients through 
um, through that process, which can be very, very stressful. So there's a component of women's health and psychology there too, which is cool. Um, again, in interventional radiology, they do over 200 procedures. Here's a list of a few of them. This might be kind of alphabet soup for you guys, but they do some really, really, really cool stuff to say the least. Um, regarding residency, so you go through this process called the match, right? And this happens during your fourth year of medical school. And so radiology is one of the specialties that requires what's called a intern year. Um, and this is separate from your four years of radiology residency. So I am at Hennepin County Medical Center, which is in Minneapolis here. Um, and I'm doing my transitional year. There are other types of intern years called internal medicine years and surgery years that also count towards um, your intern year before you actually start as a second year resident for your radiology residency. And so I'll technically, I'm technically a University of Minnesota employee. So um, after you know one intern year, four years of diagnostic radiology residency, then I'd say it's safe to say 90 to 95% of people do a fellowship. So that is typically a year. I think neurointerventional radiology is the exception to that. That would be two years. And there's multiple paths to get to IR, for example, if that's what you're interested to, interested in. Um, I talked about some of the fellowships that are available uh, to do um, in radiology after basically five years of training, and some of them are listed here again. Um, so basically, it'll take you at least six years, possibly seven years. So something to keep in mind. It is a long road, but um, for good reason, because patient outcomes basically you know, kind of ride on your diagnosis. It's one of the few specialties where you're actually making hard diagnoses. The other specialty would be pathology, for example, that is really focused on um, on diagnostics. Um, regarding residency, you know, sometimes it feels like this where the attending is saying, oh, good job on the report. You know, you really nailed the diagnosis. And you're like, oh, thank you. And then here they're like, I'm just going to make a few minor changes to uh, finalize that. And, you know, they're talking into their dictaphone here and they're like, delete that and then change, changing this on your report or whatever. Um, so there is a lot There's a lot to know. You know, the learning curve is very steep. Um, if you're wondering at this point, wait a minute, aren't all radiologists gonna be replaced by a computer? Well, here is a wonderful radiologist. His name is Dr. Cellini. He did a video on artificial intelligence and I would highly recommend you watch that if you're interested in this topic. It's a very, very exciting uh, field of research. Basically, I'll preface things by saying, people have been saying, doctors will be replaced by machines forever. Starting in 1976, I think there was a paper in the literature talking about how hospitalists will be replaced, that computers will be able to take in all of the data that they analyze. Um, so people have been trying to predict this for a while. Um, it's actually kind of already here. So we have computer-aided diagnostics in mammography already. If you ask a breast imager, how do you like it? Most people will say it's not that good. So. There's a lot of um, aspects to overcome uh, before even AI is even useful. So we have to think about who is building these algorithms because everyone is biased. And algorithms have been demonstrated to have bias. So, you know, these algorithms, who can explain them? They're kind of like black boxes. So you kind of feed it data and then it can't tell you how it arrived at a diagnosis. But if you ask a radiologist, how did you arrive at a diagnosis, they will be able to explain to you in a logical fashion. So it's kind of a, um, it's kind of a black box phenomenon. Um, who's going to oversee it? Is that going to be the engineers or the doctors? Who's going to take liability for that? Um, what about hacking? You know, there are sometimes glitches in software, as we all know. Um, how is it going to be implemented? You know, there needs to be um, a lot of thought put into how is this going to actually come into clinical use into the software that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. So at this point, I think it's safe to say that it has uh, narrow application uses. Um, so it's really good for like nailing one diagnosis, um, but a radiologist may have multiple diagnoses in their mind as part of the differential. Um, you might argue, well, can't a computer, you know, see pixels better or pick up on more, more pixels? Then the question becomes, is that pixel or is that, uh, you know, area of gray or whatever you're seeing, is that clinically relevant? So some things that are statistically significant aren't always clinically significant. So I think that's also important to know. And there's much, much lower hanging fruit to 
um, to kind of worry about instead of replacing a physician. You know, you can worry about scheduling or triaging studies. Let's say there's a list of 20 studies building up on the list. If um, number 19, maybe that one's like some sort of head bleed, then we can maybe have a algorithm to see that, you know, kind of see it virtually, right? And then push it up to your, the next study on your list. So to speak, to make it more urgent, if that makes sense. Um, so in the end, I think what, what's important to know is that um, AI will supplement the radiologist to basically improve patient outcomes. And this is ultimately the goal, right? It's ultimately all about patient care. Um, so I, safe to say in th you know, 30, 40 years, the practice of radiology will look much different than it looks now, much like it, you know, the practice of radiology now looks different than it did 40 years ago, for example. So we started off with x-rays, ultrasounds, then we got CT and MRI, we have digital, uh, you know, digital x-rays and computers. And then, you know, the art of the physical exam is forever lost is kind of the evolution of, of this. And then maybe this will be the, the end of, uh, end of the human radiologist. We'll see. Um, I think a question to ask yourself is what would my loved one want? What would a patient want? What would, um, what would my mom or brother or sister or parent want? So would you want a computer making your diagnosis or would you want an actual, actual physician looking over, um, looking over that to ensure safety? Again, you know, the robot is saying, the robot is saying here, I missed a, diagnos a, a diagnosis. What do I do now? You know, I'm going to get sued. <laughs> and he's like, well, you know, comes with the job. So this is potentially an issue, you know, when we hand over radiology to the computers. So we'll see what happens. It's very interesting to say the least. So there are a lot of misconceptions. I talked about some of those earlier. Um, it's not, I think the specialty has, it does have introverts, but it also has a good amount of extroverts. So you have to be a very good communicator. I don't think being socially awkward is a good thing um, if you're a radiologist. So we're not only socially awkward introverts. There's a wide variety of uh, personalities. Um, in my class, we're all very, you know relatively social. Um, so we have all types of personalities. Um, there is a good amount of patient care that people are not aware of, which I think is important to know. Um, Reading imaging is, is not easy. We'll, we'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, not all scans have radiation. Some people will automatically assume that, let's say an MRI scan has radiation. Well, it has non-ionizing radiation. So it doesn't have ionizing radiation, which has implications for cancer. Um, and some people think AI will replace the radiologist. And I think we kind of busted that myth right here. Um, this is a funny cartoon. Again, this is the radiologist in therapy. And he's like, <laughs> You and I aren't that different, Doc. We both see right through people. So I hope you enjoy these uh, these cartoons. So we can take a break here. We can answer some questions if you guys like. Um, or we can get into um, kind of cases and anatomy and all that stuff. Okay, this question is, I was wondering if you know of any radiology internships for high school students. So if you're in high school, I think, I'm glad you guys are enjoying the memes. <laughs> um, if you're in high school, I think the goal is basically to get into a good college. So I wouldn't worry about radiology at this point, if you're in high school. I think the goal is to get into a good college do well in college and then get into medical school and then learn as much as you can in medical school and then when it comes down to applying to a specialty then worry about doing um more radiology rotations because those rotations will really be an immersive experience for you um to really know so that will be kind of like an inter internship if you want if you're really interested in it you could always go to your local hospital or if you have a family friend who is a radiologist just ask them like hey can i spend a day with you, or can I spend a week with you or a month if you have like a summer? 
So I would just encourage you to reach out to radiologists and uh, pick their brain in person. I think that's the best thing to do. And just show up in person, see what procedures they do, um, see what the radiology technologists do, how they scan people, all that stuff, and see if you could kind of see yourself in that role. Uh, this question was, what was the MCAT like? So I took the old MCAT. I took it the last day, I think, that it um, switched over to the new MCAT. So I can't really speak to it. Um, I think I did about average. Um, I think I got like 67th percentile, whatever that converts to the current score now. I took it twice, so don't get discouraged. I would definitely recommend you do better on it the second or third time that you take it. Um, the MCAT is just a crazy exam. I think you just gotta you just gotta do your best. Um, it's almost impossible to fully prepare for it. I think USMLE World has a wonderful uh, question bank for the MCAT. So just use some sort of videos or books to kind of get fundamental knowledge. Then test yourself with a question bank. It doesn't matter if you bomb the question bank. It doesn't matter at all, as long as you're learning from that. And then do the uh, double AMC practice full lengths and use Anki to kind of do flashcards and take notes to really get that information in your brain. Um, this question is, I wonder what are some college recommendations you have for radiology? I'm not sure I understand this question um, fully, but you know, you're know you gonna have to take the pre-med courses that every pre-med has to take. So certainly physics is important in radiology, but again, the physics that you learn is a little different. It's more medical physics rather than kinematics and equations and stuff like that. So I think my advice for um, you know, colleges is just basically go to the best school that you can get into. And of course, this, you know, depends on like tuition and financial aid and geography and all these things. So, um, yeah, just do your best at each point. And let me know how you guys like these memes. So, um, here we have, um, here we have a chest x-ray with a lot of anatomy displayed here. So it's kind of a busy, uh, a busy slide here, but we have the trachea or the windpipe. We have the carina where the trachea bifurcates. Of course, we have the lungs on the right and the left. So this is the left side. Um, we have the heart here. So we have the right atrium or the left ventricle. Um, this is the diaphragm here on both sides. Down here, we have what's called the costophrenic angle. Oops. Um, and this is where sometimes fluid can hide and kind of blunt this angle. Um, it's nice and sharp here, so this is normal. Uh, the lungs have different zones or lobes. So we have the apex here and then upper, middle, and lower. Same on the left. We can see all the clavicle and the scapula here and kind of the ribs, right? Um, so some basics that I want you to take away is that this is the left side and this is the right side, okay? Um, past that, I went over some of the basic anatomy, you know, where things are sitting. Um, you'll memorize this stuff in medical school, so don't worry about it right now. Um, as far as how we describe things in radiography or in x-rays, we say things are either lucent or opaque. Lucent basically means that it's more black. So the lungs have air in them, right? We also have vasculature going through them or vessels. And um, opaque means uh, wider or more dense. So as you can see here, the heart has more stuff going on in it. And so it's more radio opaque is how we would say that. Um, for example, if there is a lucency in let's say one of these ribs, that might be a rib fracture, right? So I think just lucent versus opaque, you know, black versus white, kind of not dense or air versus dense um, or like bone is kind of how you can think about x-rays really basically. Um, this is a awesome uh, Instagram page, the radiology guy. He has these really nice diagrams. Again, this is just describing all of the anatomy that is present below, you know, kind of what we're seeing. So this is the heart with all the chambers. Again, we talked about some of this anatomy. The liver sits over here on the right. And then we have the stomach and the spleen over here. And the pancreas, of course, sits down here. So this is a CT scan. And I just want you to compare this type of imaging to the x-ray before. So I'll go back. So it looks a little different, although we are seeing many of the same structures, right? So this is the trachea. Again, it splits into right here where the carina is to the bronchi. Then we have the lungs. 
then we have the portion of the heart here, the left atrium, liver on the right, stomach and spleen, diaphragm, of course. And the way you can think about this is like, this is like kind of a cut through um, the human body. So there's different planes that you can anatomically cut the body in, so to speak. And this will, for example, this, this plane here, the transverse plane, kind of going down, you'll kind of see like slice by slice what the human body looks like. Um, and we'll have some imaging of the uh, abdomen here to kind of describe that. So here's a here's a case uh, for you guys. This will be the first case. So this is a 65 year old female, and this person is coming in with a history of COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and this is most commonly due to smoking, smoking tobacco. And so this patient is coming in with fever. So we might say that they are fe febrile, um, shortness of breath or dyspnea or difficulty breathing. They are having sputum production. Let's say it's green in color or yellow in color. And then they're also having pleuritic chest pain. And this means that when they inspire, when they take a deep breath, it hurts and causes chest pain. They also might have tachypnea, which means elevated respiratory rate or breathing fast and tachycardia, which means an elevated heart rate. So um, this might prompt you, you know, after you gather a history and look at the vital signs, for example, to do a physical exam. So if you put your stethoscope on their lungs, maybe on the right side, let's say, where we see this opacity, uh, you might hear some crackles. Um, this might also prompt you to get some sort of lab work, like a complete blood count or a CBC, and look at their blood and see that they have leukocytosis or elevated white blood cell counts. So this is often a marker of infection or inflammation. So let me know in the chat here kind of what you guys think so far as, uh, as far as a differential diagnosis. And if you guys don't know, that's okay too. Um, I'll go ahead and describe it. And we might call this a right lower lobe opacity. And this might be consistent with a bacterial pneumonia. So pneumonia is, a, is what you can call uh, a lung infection. If the patient's asking what's going on. You can just tell them they have an infection in their lung. And so this is commonly treated with antibiotics. And we might follow a chest X-ray you know, throughout this person's hospitalization to make sure that this opacity or this pneumonia is resolving, for example. Okay, and speaking of pneumonias, this is a pneumonia because COVID can cause pneumonia. So both bacteria and viruses can cause pneumonias. Sometimes a virus like the flu can cause a pneumonia um, and then you can get a secondary bacterial pneumonia on top of that. And those are really, really nasty. So the way we describe the COVID pneumonias are peripheral ground glass opacities because this is in the periphery of the lung. And these are called ground glass opacities because they look like ground glass. And it's basically kind of like junkiness in the in the lung. So this should not be there. Um, you, you might also see vascular dilation or consolidation. So again, this is the radiology guy. And he has an awesome Instagram page. Um, when we get x-rays, chest x-rays, it's really important to get a head-on view and also a side view. This is illustrating the importance of that here, because when you're looking at something, you know, let's say that opacity on uh, that patient's, I think it, yeah, on the right side, uh, that pneumonia, we don't know exactly where it is in three-dimensional space. So it could be behind the heart or it could be behind the sternum, for example. Um, not that I thought that that's where that pneumonia was, but for example, it could be hiding back here or it could be hiding back there. And it's, it's tricky because you're looking at a two-dimensional image of a three-dimensional structure. So you have to kind of imagine and put uh, all of this in, into three-dimensional space. So if we're just finding an opacity that's retrocardiac or behind the heart, then you don't know if it's like right or left, for example, until you get that frontal view. So that would kind of help you triangulate where something is. Um, again, for the same reason here, you know, you might mistake something as, uh, you might mistake something that you see head on um, and not know what's going on uh, if you don't get that side view. So uh, next case here, and it's okay if you guys don't know, 
Um, I think it's just fun to have the chat going on. Um, so feel free to mention what you think the diagnoses might be along the way here. So this is a case of a 58 year old male. We have another chest X right here for you guys. And this person has a history of coronary artery disease or heart disease. And they're also presenting with shortness of breath or dyspnea or problems breathing. And they have something that's called orthopnea, which is when you feel better when you have to lay in bed and sit up using two or three pillows. And so that's called orthopnea. Um, this patient might have a respiratory rate of 30, and that is definitely elevated. I'd say if it's over 20 or 24 respirations per minute. It's probably high. So they're breathing fast. And on top of that, um, their oxygen saturation, you know, with the little, you know, fingertip uh, oxygen monitor, it shows that it's 90%. And if you listen to their lungs, you might hear something called rails. And if you decide to get some sort of blood work, you'll probably get all sorts of blood work, but one of those might be a brain natriuretic peptide. And this is relatively specific for condition that I'll talk about in just a moment here. So this patient has a elevated BNP. So I'll just kind of go through this and let me know what you guys think the differential is here. And again, if you don't know, it's okay. So we have these arrows and these are basically pointing at opacities that wouldn't kind of normally be there. So one way a radiologist might describe this is fluffy, bilateral because they're on both sides, um, perihilar, um, bat wing configuration or angel wing configuration, if you can kind of imagine, this is kind of like a bat wing or angel wing configuration of opacities. And this would all be consistent with pulmonary alveolar edema, secondary to congestive heart failure. So this patient um, might need to get diuresed and to be given IV um, diuretics like Lasix or furosemide, if you guys have heard of that. So this patient basically has heart failure. So this is all fluid in the lungs if they're asking you what's going on. Uh, the last case was a lung infection, and then this would be a uh, case of fluid in the lungs uh, due to heart failure. So when we get imaging, it's also our job to look at the priors. So what does that mean? So this is a meme in the office saying, corporate needs you to find this, the differences between this picture and this picture. And then Pam's like, all right, they're the same picture. But the point here is that if you are looking at this X-ray, you want to pull up this patient's prior x-ray if they had prior imaging so that way you can compare as to what's going on today and think to yourself is this consistent with what's going on clinically and then compare it to why they had that chest x-ray previously so you always want to make sure that you're looking at the priors and pulling up those images in order to compare them because for example a patient may not have had tuberculosis on imaging from let's say five years ago or ten years ago and then they have a new onset tuberculosis. So that'd be really helpful for us to uh, put on our report, for example. Um, this is a funny cartoon and this person's like, what kind of surgical hardware is this? You know, sometimes we can see surgical clips, you know, where the gallbladder is. And then here, you know, this person's saying like, hey, those are just the uh, bra straps. And yeah, <laughs> um, you know, we can, we can pull up, we can see, like I said, the heart here and bones and stuff, but we can also see metal and metallic objects. So sometimes a child might swallow a coin um, or or really swallow anything like a like a battery, or like a button battery, for example, we can see that metallic object in their body. Um, this is just some basic anatomy again of the hand. I think these are some really cool diagrams here. Um, I think one anatomical uh, thing I'll point out is just the scaphoid bone, uh, bone sits here just the bone of the hand and um, the radius is here and the ulna, of course, and this, this is all the hand anatomy, which is really nicely displayed here for you guys. And there's a lot of anatomy that I have listed out here for you guys. And um, and we'll kind of just blast right through it because it is, it is quite a lot. Um, this is the cervical spine. So you can see kind of spinous processes here. You can see kind of the spinal canal here, right? You can see each vertebra here. You can also see the trachea. Um, and the epiglottis. And sometimes you'll get imaging like this for epiglottitis, for example. Of course, you see the skull, the occipital bone back here, and there is an opening at the base of the skull called the foramen magnum. So um, again, more x-rays for you guys. We see the scapula, of course, 
we see a lot of the same anatomy that we see before, but we see the kind of shoulder joint a little bit better here. So this is the humeral head, then this, this is the surgical neck of the humerus, um, et cetera, and so on. And you always have to keep in mind that there's all this vasculature flowing through all this stuff. So there's, there's kind of a, this is kind of a busy part of the body because there's also the brachial plexus, um, which is a collection of nerves that runs through here. And this is more anatomy, you know, the coracoid process, the AC joint, uh, et cetera, and so on. Um, more anatomy, again, this is the elbow, of course. Uh, this is the humerus coming down. These are some nerves, the ulnar nerve, if you can imagine that, median nerve, artery again. You know, this is kind of posterior and this is anterior. This is backwards, right? This is like the back of the elbow. This is the front. Radius and ulna, kind of how we saw in the hand. Um, and we don't only look at x-rays, we look at ultrasounds too. So if I have an ultrasound probe, I put some jelly on it. If you guys have seen um, uh, patients who are, or family members who have been pregnant, you know, they'll ultrasound kind of the baby. Um, and we can also do that for the abdomen, even in a non-pregnant patient. So we could take a look at the liver, the pancreas, et cetera, and so on, as well as the gallbladder and kidneys. Um, this would be a CT scan of the abdomen. Again, we see a lot of the same anatomy we saw before, except maybe with a little bit more spatial resolution or separation. So a little bit higher detail here. Um, we see the kidneys here, right and left, spleen, stomach, liver. You see, you know, some vertebrae here with the intervertebral discs. And this is the psoas muscle. And you guys will learn all about this stuff in medical school. So um, it is a lot to know. Um, this is the sigmoid colon and the bladder over here. Um, moving along, this is a um, scan of the gallbladder, and I'll just briefly gloss over this because it's 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 a bit much to uh, to explain. <laughs> um, more imaging. Uh, this is cool because you can. This is the uh, the same radiology guy, and he has displayed here kind of what a disc herniation or a slipped disc looks like. So there's these discs here, and they have this central portion called the nucleus pulposus, and that can kind of uh, retro pulse out here and then compress the nerve root and cause pain, kind of shooting down someone's leg, for example. So hope you guys find this stuff interesting. Um, this is more uh, abdominal anatomy. And so if you compare this to this, this is these are different slices, but the same or similar part of the body, right? So we have many of the same organs here, except this is kind of like a cross section, if you can imagine like that. And again, another cross section here, but this is an abdominal MRI. So you can kind of see some differences between CT scans and MRIs, right? A lot of the same organs, liver, spleen. This would be, you know, kind of moving downwards. This would be a pelvic MRI. These are commonly used to look at the uh, prostate gland. Um, moving downwards, we have an abdominal X-ray here. Oftentimes patients have constipation and abdominal pain, um, or they may not have had a bowel movement in many weeks. And so sometimes you'll get an abdominal x-ray to rule out a small bowel obstruction, for example. Um, you can see some of the intestine here, colon, bladder again, uh, ileum, kind of the, the femur here with the uh, femoral head and neck. So um, sometimes patients have things in them and you might ask yourself, how did that get there? Or what could this be? So um, what do you guys think this is? <laughs> All right, the chat lit up. Glad to see it. Oh, the chat's lighting up. All right, a jar, a bottle, a jar. Yeah, good. This is a, uh, a cookie jar. Yep. <laughs> so I'll leave it up to your imagination to think about maybe how did this get there? Yeah, <laughs> you guys are like, no, why? <laughs> um, oftentimes, kind of the joke in radiology is like, we suggest that you correlate clinically. So there might be some up some something up someone's butt, and then you might have to go check that part of the patient out clinically in person to see exactly what's going on. So um, it's kind of a kind of a joke in radiology. It's like correlate clinically, um, which is something that we say in the report. So, 
yeah, uh, again, the same point here. I don't know if you guys see it here. Let me know if you do see it in the in the in the chat here. Yep, yeah, you guys got it. <laughs> so yeah, this is like we're just gonna correlate clinically on this one. Um, yeah, again, some more abdominal um, anatomy here. We've talked about a lot of these um, these organs already. So I hope this kind of colors a picture of abdominal anatomy for you guys in many different modalities. You know, we looked at x-rays, MRIs, CT scans, and a little bit of ultrasound as well. So, so this is the radiology guy again, all of this anatomy colored. And this is in comparison to a CT scan that is maybe not labeled because you're not gonna have a CT scan come to you in clinical practice that is labeled. Um, so we have to have all of this information, if you can imagine, in our mind when we're going through or scrolling through an image. This would be the aorta. And here we see an abdominal aortic aneurysm, which is something that oftentimes requires surgical repair. And we see uh, a lot of this vascular anatomy, which is pretty cool to look at as well. We see the right and left iliacs. So pretty cool, as well as the renal arteries here. Um, I talked about breast imaging earlier. So this would be an example of breast cancer. So this is kind of where the pectoralis muscle sits. And um, yeah, I just think it's it's cool that, uh, you know, women's health and kind of that public health aspect of medicine is part of our specialty as well. So kind of moving down here, we have x-ray of the knee. There is, you know, vessels and vasculature running through. So here we have the tibia and the fibula, and then coming downwards is the um, femur, of course, and the patella sits here. We have some tendons in here, quadricep tendon, patellar tendon. Um, you know, some of you may have heard of the uh, lateral collateral ligaments or the medial collateral ligaments. Those kind of sit here, or the ACL and the PCL, posterior and anterior collateral ligaments. This is a, another wonderful um, Instagram page, the radiologist. He has these really cool um, anatomical overlays that I've been uh, pulling up for you guys. Again, the femur, patella, tibia, and fibula. Uh, moving down to the foot, we see kind of the calcaneus over here, calcaneus, artery, artery, tibia coming down, fibula, if you can imagine, you know, it's kind of over here. So sometimes things overlap and you have to imagine in your mind where something is sitting in three-dimensional space. We have the um, navicular over here and of course the talus. So um, I think neuroradiology is also really cool to look at. Um, there is a lot of anatomy to know. Um, this is an MRI of the brain. So um, we have the frontal lobe here, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, cerebellum, we have the corpus callosum, which connects the two sides of the brain, or the two hemispheres. We have the thalamus, ventricles here, midbrain, pons, medulla, and the spinal cord. And you can even catch the tongue over here, which is cool. Some of you may have heard of the pituitary gland. And so that is a very, very important endocrine organ that's really small, and it sits here. And sometimes you can have a pituitary tumor. So something to keep in mind. Um, Kind of wrapping things up, we'll have just a couple more cases left. So this is a case of a 45 year old male and he presented with head trauma. And this may have been from slipping on ice if it's winter where you're living and hitting his, his head. So this might prompt the emergency doctor, for example, to get a CT scan of this person's head. And so you might see something that's described as lenticular shaped or lens shaped. And this is a hyper intense lesion in the left frontal region of the brain. Um, and we also see kind of this fracture of the frontal bone as well. So this would be consistent with what's called an epidural hematoma. So hematoma is a collection of blood. So hema for blood, oma for like mass. And there are other types of brain bleeds as well. This is just one type of brain, brain bleed that I thought was um, uh, good to know about. So um, another case here, this is a 40 year old female and so obviously the arrows are pointing at something. I just included these images so that you guys kind of know where to fixate your eye. And so this is a 40 year old female and this person is presenting with blurry vision for two weeks. So 
you might get instead of a head CT, you might want to get a head MRI. And so this is what we're looking at here. So this person has blurry vision for two weeks. They might also have difficulty walking. And um, the way we might describe these lesions is that they're periventricular or near the ventricles. We saw the ventricle on um, the lateral ventricle on an, uh, the anatomy labeled earlier. And these are kind of globular foci. Um, and so just think to yourself, what, what might this be? You know, what, what could the differential be here? So this is all kind of consistent with um, multiple sclerosis. And so in MS, you get plaques or these kind of periventricular globular plaques. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys find this interesting. Um, this is a quick YouTube video of a very, very high resolution MRI scan of a 58 year old female who died of non-neurological causes and she did not have a history of neurological disease. But the reason this is a really cool MRI scan is because it was scanned for 100 hours straight. So what, over three days? Um, so quite some time in a seven Tesla MRI scanner. So MRI is called magnetic resonance imaging. So the word magnetic is in there. So it uses a huge magnet that is a magnetic field um, to look at the uh, organ that you are scanning. So the, basically the bigger the magnet or the stronger the magnet, say seven Tesla magnet, um, other institutions might have a 1.5 Tesla or three Tesla magnet. Um, you know, this gives us a really, really high resolution uh, look at the brain, which is gonna be a fantastic contribution to medical science and research and kind of the neuroradiology community, so. All right, so kind of wrapping up here, this is a meme saying, you know, I thought it was fractured. Um, you know, the doctor said it was fractured and this patient was afraid that it was broken. So this is, sometimes patients don't always know that um, a fracture is the same thing as a broken bone. So um, just, you know, whenever you're talking to a patient in the future, just tell them that it is fractured. And if they're wondering if it's broken, just tell them it's broken as well. Cause sometimes people will know one thing over the other, but not know that they are, uh, the same. So you are interested in radiology so far. Um, that's awesome. Go ahead and screenshot this page. And these are some resources that'll kind of help you. It's a lot, it's a lot of information, but these are resources that will really help guide you throughout your kind of journey. Um, oops, go back here. Um, so this, so Ben White's blog, he's a radiologist, I believe in Texas. He has just a fantastic, very, very informative blog about many aspects of our radiology, including residency and applications. Um, check out the AMSER guide when it actually comes to the uh, nuts and bolts of actually applying to radiology. I think the American College of Radiology and the Alliance of Medical Student Educators, uh, they kind of put together this really awesome PDF guide. Um, if you follow that, you will definitely match into radiology as a medical student. Um, if you're really into podcasts, I think the undifferentiated medical student, he has interviewed at least three radiologists on his podcast. Definitely give a listen uh, to those. Um, Rad's resident or director one, he has a question and answer blog. And if you just subscribe to uh, those emails, you'll kind of get a feel for what topics are radiologists having questions about or are residents thinking about and you know, kind of where are medical students, uh, where's their head at when it comes to applications. Um, of course, social media is a fantastic fantastic resource. So I'd encourage you to check out YouTube and Instagram and TikTok. Um, my handle is here, of course. You should definitely follow me if you don't already. Um, I do respond to my DMs relatively um, frequently. And then these are some fantastic radiologists and residents and some attendings here who just, they, they put out really, really great uh, content. Um, so in summary, I think some people think radiology is easy, but it's not all black and white. There is a lot of gray area. So a little bit, of, a little bit of a pun here, but there is a lot of gray area, you know. Um, let me know what questions you guys have. This, this is kind of a funny tweet, um, you know. Daddy, what are all, what are all those lights in the sky that move? Um, this is also a hilarious uh, Twitter account, and he's like, the radiologist, is like, well, you know, when a radiologist, dermatologist, and ophthalmologist finishes their intern year, which is the first year of training, like I like I described earlier, they throw their stethoscopes and launch them into orbit. Beautiful, isn't it? 
And it's just funny because like, I didn't really enjoy using my stethoscope all that much. I still enjoy talking to patients and examining them, but I didn't, uh, yeah, I didn't feel inspired to use my stethoscope. So there's, there's some truth to this. Um, let me know what you guys found the most interesting, what case you liked the most, what you learned, um, or if you didn't learn anything. Uh, definitely like and comment and share and do all of those social media things if this was valuable to you in any way, shape, or form. Uh, definitely give me a follow. Um, and please, please, please feel comfortable reaching out. So I hope you guys enjoyed this and you guys like the memes and all that stuff. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, there are some questions in the chat. Uh, would you mind answering them? By any chance, do you have time? Yeah, so Rosemary is wondering, um, I have been considering RADS for a while. How much exposure do you get from radiation as a resident versus senior doctor? Yeah, so you're right here. So she's saying I've heard residents get more of the footwork going in and out of the rooms, but I'm not sure how true that is. So it depends. So I think it's safe to say interventional radiologists get the most radiation exposure, but that's why we wear uh, protective equipment like lead suits and thyroid shields, um, as well as in order to prevent cataracts, we wear lead lined um, goggles or glasses. Um, and some people even wear a scrub cap that has like a lead lined a lead lining here to um there's some literature i don't know much about it but you know some possible relationship between physicians who work with radiation like interventional cardiologists for example they might have an increased incidence of brain masses i don't know if that's causal yet or correlational we'll see i think it's it just depends on the specialty that you're in i don't know that it depends on resident versus attending um i think it depends on your exposure over your lifetime, basically. Abigail is wondering, um, what would you say are the most important qualities of being a good doctor? And what career would you have pursued if you were not a, a physician? <laughs> um, that's tough to answer a kind of generic question like that. There are many qualities that go into being a good doctor. Obviously, intelligence and book smarts and all that is important but just as important or if not more important is emotional intelligence and social intelligence right because sometimes patients um their complaint might not be how much my doctor knows or how knowledgeable he is or she is but it's like they didn't touch me or they didn't examine me or they didn't listen to me so i think those are very important qualities there are so many important qualities so I'll just throw those those few out there. Um, as far as what career I would have pursued if it wasn't medicine, I don't really know because I thought about a lot of different careers. And I think being a doctor, for me, fit my personality, my career goals, what I wanted out of life, all of that stuff. If you are kind of lukewarm about the idea of medical school, that's OK. Just know that um, it's a fantastic career. It's very, very rewarding if you Go on US News World and report what are the top jobs. You know, you'll find, you know, computer engineer, physician assistant, NP, and many, many of those top 25 jobs are some sort of doctor, surgeon, you know, so it's not like number one versus number 50 is worse than the other. It's just like they're different jobs. So do you want to be a physical therapist? There's, you know, healthcare is, is a fantastic field. So I think being a physician is fantastic because you can do clinical work, you can do research. You can do a lot of teaching and mentoring. You can do policy work in government or even go to industry and do like biotech or pharma stuff. Or in radiology, you can do AI kind of startup tech stuff. So um, I don't know what I would do because I'd probably still do it the same. Okay, so Michelle is wondering how do radiologists determine which scan or piece of equipment is best to use? Um, great question. So you learn a little bit about this in medical school. You learn kind of which organ should be getting which type of imaging modality in medical school. You kind of refine that skill in residency. And then 
you know, if you still have a question, like I still don't know what test to order, then you can just call the radiologist and they'll have a conversation with you about what you're concerned about for a patient. Okay, Michelle is wondering, um, what was the most effective study method that you have used in the past? I'm probably gonna do an Instagram post on this. Um, and there's many study methods that uh, work. And so you have to, number one, figure out what works for you. But there are also some principles of studying or the science of learning how to learn um, that hold true for any type of learner. And so they're kind of more evidence-based or really rooted in the psychology and the research of learning. And so I think number one is the concept of spaced repetition. And the, number two is the concept of forced recall. So what does that mean? So if you download the flashcard application called Anki, I'll drop it in the chat here, it's A-N-K-I. Um, it is a spaced repetition flashcard program where you create your flashcards, they have a front and back side, um, or you might have like a diagram of let's say anatomy and you block out what the word is and then try to recall it in your mind. And so let's say you have a, um, let's say you have a, an X-ray and it's pointing at, um, let's say where the liver would sit. And the first flashcard is like, what is this organ? Well, on the back side of that card, you know, just like a flashcard, it will say liver. So if you get that, flashcard correct, then it will show you that flashcard in three days. If you get it correct again, then it'll show it to you in seven days, et cetera, and so on, because there's a forgetting curve. So over time, um, our brains are prone to forgetting information if we don't see it over and over again. So if you were, let's say, to get that question wrong on you know, day seven or that second time that you see that card, then the algorithm resets and it goes back to the beginning of the pile. And so it'll show it to you in one day's time or three days time, for example. So I don't know if that makes sense, but basically for flashcards, you can space them out. So the spaced repetition. So that way you're always bringing it to the front of your memory, kind of like this over time. So the amount of information that you learn is more and that way you retain it over time. And the idea of forced recall is being put in the hot seat and trying to think, how can I come up with this answer or the concept or the ideas behind uh, what is being tested right now in my own mind? Because if I can bring that in, into um, the forefront of my own mind, then that likely means that I can teach it to someone else and that I could actually perform on test day. So I think those are super important uh, study methods that, gosh, I, I wish I knew about them in undergrad. I really did. Um, there's also a lot to say about kind of writing things out instead of typing. For some reason, there's psychology research about how writing things out by hand is just superior for uh, memorizing and for remembering and for re retaining. I think it's because the process is a little slower, so it's a little bit more deliberate. But again, you know, do whatever works for you. That might be videos or books. Um, Okay, so Rosemary, you are very welcome. Um, this question is it's for the admissions process for residency. How common is it for students to attend residency in the same state as medical school? Um, so it might help to know what type of, um, or how the residency process works. So. When you are a fourth year medical student, early on in fourth year, so in like the fall, you submit your residency application. And this includes a lot of the similar things that are in your med school application, letters of recommendation, personal statement, grades, board scores, evaluations from your rotations, et cetera, and so on. And so you'll apply, let's say anywhere from 10 programs or 50 or a hundred programs even. Um, and then, those institutions will contact you for an interview or they'll waitlist you or they'll decline you for an interview. So you may go on, let's say five interviews or 10 or 20 interviews or even 30 interviews. And then you'll rank those programs one through 30 or one through 10 or however many you get. And then it's up to the matching algorithm to decide 
kind of where you landed on the, the institution's maps list and then where those programs are on your rank list, if that makes sense. And then they pair you up. So, you know, the matching algorithm is a little complicated, but that's kind of the gist of it. So it, it wildly depends on number one, the specialty that you're applying to, how competitive is it? And number two, the institution, how competitive is the, are the programs that you're applying to? Um, and then how competitive are you as an applicant, as a medical student? Um, those factors will dictate where you, um, where you end up matching and how far down your rank list you go. So I think for more competitive specialties, it's safe to say that students will likely get a lower pick or a lower choice on average. Um, so if you want to stay in your own state for residency, then you could be very strategic about your rank list and put those programs in the state that you want to match in, in your top three or top five or however many there are. In Minnesota, there's only two radiology programs, for example, just at the university here and at Mayo Clinic. So if I want to stay in Minnesota, then I could only rank those two programs. But you know, you might get your third choice. And so you might go down to your third choice and then it just depends on where you end up matching. So let me know if that makes sense. But I do suspect that there is a somewhat of a regional geographic bias. So it is difficult to get out of those geographic restrictions if you so wish to do so because of significant other or you just wanna live somewhere new. Um, so there are ways to kind of get around that. Yeah, I think that was the last question. So unless someone has a last minute question they wanna throw in the chat, um, I just wanna say again, thank you so much for coming. I loved your presentation, very funny, very informative, very engaging. Um, yeah, so I loved your presentation, your talk, everything was so like, I learned a lot, so thank you. Awesome, and um, make sure to spread the good word if you found value out of all this. And again, I'm, I'm no farther than an Instagram direct message. So um, thanks for your time, you guys will do great. So you guys asked some, asked some really great questions. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Talk to you later. Have a good night.